We've talked about mechanisms to try and secure our computer system. We've seen user authentication, check that the right person is accessing it. Uh, we, before that, we saw general mechanisms of cryptography, how to encrypt or to encrypt files. You've had some homework to encrypt files, public key cryptography and symmetric key cryptography, and mentioned uh, some other cryptographic techniques. Last topic, we looked at access control. We control who can do what with different files or different resources. This topic is looking at from the perspective of the attacker and some of the things that can go wrong on our computer system and that involves executing malicious software. Executing software that does something unexpected or does something bad on our computer system or shortened to malware. Viruses, worms and other malicious software will we'll mention and talk about the, uh, the difference between them and finish with a few ways for trying to protect against malicious software. So this topic is about trying to describe malicious software so that we're aware of it and uh, so that we can work out ways to try and defend against it. Has anyone been affected by malicious software? Anyone had a virus on their computer? Yes? How do you get rid of it? What would you suggest? Maybe your, your friends get a virus on their computer. What would you suggest? <laughs> antivirus. Antivirus is maybe too late once the virus is on there. Antivirus should stop the virus getting there. If the virus is there, what can you do? <laughs> well, maybe in extreme case, what? Delete your hard drive and reinstall right? because it infects software. Right? It, unless your hard drive is infected, the software on your hard drive is infected such that when you delete the hard drive the virus is still there. We'll maybe see an example that extreme cases of malicious software don't just infect the applications on your operating system or your OS itself, they may infect special software running on dedicated hardware. And there's a case of the firmware on your hard drive gets infected. So we'll talk about different types. What is a virus and what are uh, the general operation of them. We will not go into much detail about how individual viruses work. We'll give a couple of examples, uh, but just classify different malicious software. What is it? Malware, malicious software, a program that is inserted into a system, usually covertly, so usually done in secret, the insertion with the intent of compromising one of our three aims, confidentiality, integrity, availability of the victim's data, applications or OS, or just annoying the victim. It may not release information, it may not uh, modify information, it may not uh, cause significant downtime of the system, it just may be an annoyance. All right, so that's one definition of malware. But there are many different types and the two general ways to classify different types of malware are the way that it moves, the way that it propagates to other computers and what it does when it infects a particular computer, the payload we say. So the payload is, a, is the, the malicious thing that it does. With regards to how it spreads, how it propagates, so if the malicious software is on one computer, it may do some um, malicious actions, but nowadays uh, malicious software will try to spread and move to other computers as well and infect those. So how does it spread? Well, different approaches will talk about viruses and worms. There's a slight difference between a virus and a worm as malicious software. And then social engineering which is not using computer techniques to spread but taking advantage of the fact that people will uh, maybe believe things which seem to be true which are not. So we'll mention them. The other aspect is what does it do? So malicious software can do different things. It may corrupt the system, the computer system. Uh, we'll 
talk about zombies and bots, which really take use your computer to launch other attacks. May steal information. Okay, so you've got some confidential files on your computer. The malicious software gets on your computer such that that confidential information is then released. Stealthing or hiding uh, behind, uh, or trying to hide itself and trying to collect some other information from the information theft. So we'll see some or some examples of each of those through this topic. How do we stop it? How do we stop malicious software, anti-malicious software, or we call it more specifically antivirus software? Right. So we'll finish with a, a couple of techniques of of antivirus software. Who uses antivirus software on their computer? Hands up. Okay, many people would use antivirus software. What's wrong with it? Any problems with antivirus software? Sometimes it may slow down your computer a little bit because it needs to do some checking and if it's checking a lot, checking of all the files on your disk, maybe all the network activity, that takes some CPU time, so that takes some resources. So that's one of the negatives of antivirus software, that it, it adds some inconvenience to the user. And this, this trade-off always comes up in security. To be more secure, you're generally more inconvenienced. Right? If you want to have high security, you may have to accept that things are not so easy to use. So let's go through and look at first malicious software by the different propagation techniques. How does it move from one computer to another? Any suggestions? How may a virus or a malicious, general malicious software get from, say, someone's computer, it's infected, and unfortunately infect your computer? How can you catch a virus? What do you think? How do you think a virus can get on your Mac? Probably there's one there. How? How do you think it would get there? A malicious piece of software run on here. No way that it could get on your computer. How do you think malicious software gets on other people's computers? Download a file. So you're using your computer, you download a file and you mistake that file to be something useful you think it's something useful, but it actually contains some malicious software that when you execute that file, maybe even not just execute it, but load it in a viewer, but when you do something with a file, it actually executes and does something malicious. Okay, so downloading a file when you think it's something useful, maybe it's you advertise as a free application. Oh, that's great, free. I'm going to download that. But then when you run it, it infects your computer. How else can malicious software propagate. Flash drive, you walking around and you see a flash drive on the ground, you pick it up and stick it in your computer, oh, a free flash drive infected your computer. Maybe through spam mail? Through email, so you receive an email saying here's this great product for sale and you click on the, uh, open the attachment, you open the attachment which executes and infects your computer. So there are different propagation methods. And you're aware of them, I think. Some malware has different names on d depending upon how it propagates. First, let's look at viruses. So of the propagation, we'll look at viruses, worms, and then later social engineering. First, let's look at viruses. What is a virus? A piece of software that infects programs and copies itself to other programs. By programs, so executable software. So uh, what a virus does, so some malicious software that may do something bad, it somehow attaches itself to another piece of software, like an executable file, an exe file, or some other file that can be run on your computer and then will also try and attach itself to other programs as well as a way to, to spread. And we'll look at a general structure of a virus, not, not in detail, but uh, the general approach. Uh, 
what does a virus do? We can think it goes through a number of phases. The virus is a piece of software. Initially it may do nothing. If the software is attached to an existing program, and we'll talk about how shortly, then it may be in a dormant phase where it's just sitting there doing nothing. Maybe some event triggers it to activate. Once it's activated, it will try to propagate. So typically a virus doesn't just want to infect one piece of software, it will try and infect other pieces of software and eventually on other computers. So it will try to propagate and the means of propagation is copying itself into other programs. That is, there's some EXE files on your computer, one's infected. When it runs, it copies itself and tries to attach to another EXE file executable on your computer such that when the other one is ex executed, the virus runs again and then propagates again and propagates uh, even further. So attach itself to other programs or maybe in other parts of the operating system or in memory such that when that memory is, is read, then the virus is executed. So a virus normally doesn't just propagate, it may do something bad. So we may trigger the execution of the virus. The triggering is again some, some event that activates it. Uh, so simple thing, when some time or date is, is met, when we reach some date or time, then the virus activates and executes. And the execution may be performing some function that could be harmless. Maybe it pops up a message on your screen saying you are infected by a virus. Or it could be malicious. Maybe it deletes all your files, all your JPEG files on your hard disk, as a simple example. I'm sure you can think of many malicious things that a virus could do, so we will not go through too many of them. We'll talk about uh, some concepts of the propagation and, and uh, give an example of the triggering. Because the virus infects other programs, and those programs are specific to usually uh, operating systems or computer architectures, therefore the viruses are specific to operating systems and computer architectures. That is, your word.exe file that runs on Windows, that binary program will not run on my Linux operating system. It's a different operating system and it's different format for binary files. Therefore, a virus that infects Word may not infect programs on a Linux operating system, and vice versa. A virus on Linux may not infect those on Windows. So viruses are usually specific to the OS or maybe the hardware platform. So we'll go through uh, just a, some pseudocode for a, a very, very simple virus. It doesn't do anything, but just to illustrate those four or the, those steps. But before we do that, the idea, we'll try and draw. The idea is we have, we have some program on our computer, some file. Let's say it's a, a one megabyte file. So there's a file on, on my computer. When I installed Microsoft Word, there's a word.exe file. Let's say it's one megabyte in length. And what normally happens when I click on the icon to start Microsoft Word, then this file is ex executed. So it's loaded into to memory and executed. And that brings up the Microsoft Word application. So the file is executed. So what we can think a virus does is that it attaches itself to this file. If somehow this file gets infected by a virus, then we can think that the file, when we execute this program, you can think, remember the program perform some instructions. So we run the code in the at the start of the program and, and, and run the code in here. 
Now, it's not the source code that's in the file, it's the machine instructions. So if this file is infected, then we can think that the virus attaches itself. So this is the virus here, I'll just denote as V. It attaches itself to the file, word.exe, say at the start of the file, such that when you click on the word icon, then that triggers the word.exe file to be loaded into memory and executed. What is executed? Well, first the virus code is executed. So the virus code is executed and then the normal code for Microsoft Word is executed so that the application pops up and you can edit documents. So the idea is that a virus will attach itself t normally to other programs so that when you normally execute those other programs, the virus gets executed as well. So I denote V as the virus there. And one thing the virus may do is try to propagate to other programs. So if it's already infected word.exe, when you open Microsoft Word, the virus runs, and we'll see the pseudocode in a moment, one thing it will do is try to copy other program, a copy to other programs. So if we have some other files on our computer, Microsoft Excel, so another file then what the virus does is looks, say, for other EXE files, and when it finds one, attaches itself to those. And now that that file is infected, and whenever you open Excel, the virus executes and does the same, maybe copies itself to other executables. Now that's the simple approach. Maybe the copying is not just on side, inside this computer, maybe it's to other computers as well. So what is the pseudocode of this virus V? What happens when that is executed? That's what the slide tries to show us. But in very general terms. Okay, so you can think of the source code for that virus. What would it, may it look like? Well, the general approach is like this. The program V, the virus. Uh, all right, we start at uh, the first line, go to main. Let's see. So what we do, so just to explain this code, we have some subroutines or functions. One's called infect executable, one's called do damage, one is trigger pull, so the, ge the general concept. So the first thing we do is we try to infect other executables. If we're in infected Word and someone opens Word, it tries to find other programs to infect. Once it's done that, if some conditions are met, if the trigger has been pulled, then it will try to do some damage. And once it's done that, it will go to next, and what follows next is in fact the code of the actual program. So this is the end of the virus, and now the next thing that runs is the, the word.exe, the original program, which starts up Microsoft Word, so that the user, when they click on the link to Word, they don't know that the virus runs, because they click on the link and then Word pops up. But what's happened, they click on the link, the virus infects other executables, maybe it does some damage and then the normal program starts. So that's the general approach where those subroutines infect executable. Well, in, you can not just infect one, you may go through a loop with some conditions find some random executable file, so this is just one approach, look for other files, other .exe files on the hard disk. Once you find one, check if it's already infected. 
How do you know if it's already infected? Maybe the first line of the code of that file contains a special string, right? In our simple virus, the special string is this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If the first line of code contains a special string or the start of the file contains a special string, then it's already infected. No need to infect again. So if it's already infected, then go back and try again. Find another file. Until we find a file that is not yet infected, once we do that, we attach ourselves to that currently unaffected uninfected file, that is we prepend the virus to the file. So that's the case of copying the virus to another file. And of course it may do that in, in, in different ways. It may look for multiple files, files of particular types in different locations. It may have a list of files to search for because the virus may have been programmed to run on Windows so it knows what are common EXE files on Windows, Acrobat, Word, Excel and others. So it looks for them and infects where possible. If trigger pulled, so after we infect other executables, if the trigger pulled, the concept here is that if we want to, if some event has occurred, so we'd program some conditions, return true if some conditions hold. What conditions? Maybe some date and time has been met. It's the third day of the third month in, and it's the third minute of the third hour or something. So some condition is programmed into it or maybe the presence of a particular file. Or the virus has infected 10 files already so now do some damage. So it's already propagated multiple times. Once it's propagated then start to do some damage. What's some damage can, that can be done? Give me some examples. What could a virus do? What damage could it do on your computer if it executes? Put on your black hats now. Think of what you want to program your virus to do if you want it to do damage. Destroy what? Uh, the original data. Destroy some data. So look for some data, like maybe there's some certain location where people commonly store important data, passwords or... or uh, personal data and delete it. Okay, delete files. So deleting files is damage. What? What else? Um, steal them. Not just delete them. Get those files and send them back to a server. Okay, so take a copy of those files. Uh, edit the files. Modify them. Encrypt the files. Encrypt the files and then ask you to pay for the key to decrypt them. Okay, to make some money off that. So there is viruses that do that, that they don't just delete it and make it inconvenient for you. They encrypt your file with public key cryptography such that they have the secret key to decrypt. The virus creator has the key to decrypt. Your file is encrypted. If you want it back, you need to pay the virus creator some money and they'll give you the secret key to decrypt. So that was an example of, does anyone know the name of soft viruses that did that? Anyone been infected? You're very lucky. So some, some viruses can do different types of damage. CryptoLocker was one of them. CryptoLocker was one that when it infected your computer, it looked for, I think, JPEGs, documents in your documents directory, or maybe there's an equivalent version for the Mac, and it encrypts your files, pops up a window to you saying, sorry, you've been infected. If you want to decrypt your files, you need to transfer some money, some Bitcoin in this case, transfer some money to this account, and then I'll send you the key, and you can decrypt them. And because it's using public key cryptography, there's no way to decrypt unless you have that key that they have. So it's effectively you lose your files unless you pay for them. Often referred to as ransomware. They hold your files at ransom. So that's some examples of what do damage could be. So that's the simple approach of a virus. Try to attach to files, copy to others, 
when it's executed, it may do damage if some conditions are met. How do you detect that before it's executed? What could your antivirus software do to detect this? Detect that there's a virus? Um, detect if there is a change in the virus? All right, Microsoft Word, word.exe, the file itself, if it's been modified, the exe file should not change. Right? Once the word is installed, the file should remain the same. There's no need for the program to change unless there's a software update. So if there are uh, unexpected modifications to a file, then that may be flag a warning uh, or flag to the antivirus software that something has gone wrong. Okay? So detect changes. Changes may be quite simple, the file size. The f size shouldn't get larger or smaller. Here our virus attached to the file. Word was originally one megabyte, but if we attach the virus code, it's bigger. So now the file, word.exe, maybe if the virus is uh, maybe another 20 kilobytes, say. So the file is actually one megabyte plus that extra 20 kilobytes of virus. So very easy to detect, but if you know the file size, say when it's first installed, keep track, word.exe is one megabyte. If that changes, or s then, or if it's attempted to be changed, then that's a detection of a virus. Or if it has changed and we see it's a different size, it's likely to be a virus. So that's a very simple way. Now that one could be overcome, at least the file size check. What the virus could do is, de is to compress the file as part of the infection. So not just infect itself by attaching, infect itself by attaching but also de uh, compressing the original word.exe file such that the, de the compressed version plus the virus still adds up to one megabyte. Okay, so that you can't just check the size, you need to check the, the content as well. So uh, on the slides... To overcome the file length check, what the virus can do is compress the program itself. So a compression virus compresses the program, P1, such that when you combine it with the virus, that the file size is the same as the original. So the file size doesn't change. And when it wants to run it, uncompresses or decompresses the, uh, the, the program. How else can we detect it if it's not based on file size? How could antivirus check? Right? We don't want to trust just the file size. How can we know if it's changed? Right, so we could calculate the hash of the file. That is, when again, when word.exe is installed, a new program is installed, the virus so antivirus software calculates a hash of the file. Remember, a hash function takes any size input and produces a small, fixed, and generally unique output. And we store that hash value. The antivirus software stores the hash value. So that if the file is modified, even if it's exactly the same size, if the contents are modified by the attachment of the virus, and we calculate the hash again, it'll get a different hash value. If the contents change, the hash value will change. If the hash value changes, something's gone wrong. The hash value should not change for that file. So the hash value is like a signature of that file. And that's a common technique used by virus, uh, antivirus software, you know that the, the intended file is this structure, you store the hash of the file, if later when you go and check, either when the program runs or a, a periodic check, if the hash 
is changed, then maybe the file has been changed and we should check and see if it's infected. Of course, another way would be for the antivirus to scan the contents of the file. But that's time consuming and that really slows down your computer. If it has to scan the contents of every file very often, then that can be a significant inconvenience to the user. But maybe something to, to stay secure. So that's a, a simple concept of a virus that attaches it to another program. Uh, there's a further classification of viruses. This is by what they target, what they try to attach themselves to. Uh, so some of the names given here, the a boot sector infector infects, infects the master boot record. So when your computer boots up, before the operating system loads, the, the BIOS runs and it needs to run some software to load the operating system to, to boot things up. If that area of software or area of memory is infected, if there's a virus in there, then whenever you boot your computer, that virus executes and the virus can then infect other things. So as soon as a virus is executed, we've been compromised. So a boot sector infector would have the virus installed in the area of memory on a disk usually that when the device boots up, it runs that virus. That originated in uh, floppy disks. Okay, you know the old style, maybe you don't know the old style, you know the, you've used one. Floppy disks, not USB drives. How big was a floppy disk? Fifty-eight K. Well, how big physically was the disc? So there was three and a what? Three and a half inch little square floppy disc. But before that, floppier floppy discs, the five and a quarter inch discs. So uh, and probably earlier than that as well. So floppy disc, and they were in the old days commonly used to boot the computer. There may not have been a hard disc. There is no hard disc. How does your computer store the operating system on a floppy disc? So what you did to boot your computer, you insert your disk and then the, um, the master boot record is read and then that reads from that disk and then that loads the operating system up. So if that disk was infected, it essentially infects the entire operating system or the entire operating system is compromised and anything you run, any program you run can be compromised then. A similar one which is more relevant today and much more complicated. Uh, just from some websites, there's a, one last year called, or from what's called the Equation Group. There was a virus found on the firmware. There's not much to read here. The Equation Group was the, the group attributed to this virus. It was found on the firmware of some hard drives. So you go by a hard disk. Is there anything installed on your hard disk when you buy it? You buy a new Seagate or Western Digital hard disk, there's nothing on there. Well, there is. The hard disk has its own microcontroller and some own, its own cold code to run the hard disk. Right? So the hard disk itself has what's called firmware that controls how the hard disk works. So what happened, this group was able to compromise that firmware on the hard disk. Somehow they got the hard disk manufacturers, not deliberately, that they, they got inside such that they got malicious software on the firmware on the hard disk. So you buy the hard disk, it's already infected. It doesn't have any files on it, but the firmware is infected. Now what that means is that because the firmware is compromised, anything that that hard disk does is essentially compromised. Because what the firmware can do is it can maybe reserve a certain, certain part of the hard disk 
And so when the operating system loads from the hard disk, the firmware infects the operating system immediately. You find a virus, so you delete your operating system, but the virus is still there in the firmware on the hard disk. So that was a very hard virus to uh, both create, probably took a, a country or a, a large organisation to create the virus, and very hard to, to get rid of on and detect. Antivirus software couldn't detect it because antivirus software just reads the operating system, not the firmware. So the equation group created a virus which was like a boot sector infector. A file infector is like we saw in the example, infect word.exe, infect other files. A macro virus is uh, not necessarily infecting applications, but attaching itself to documents which are normally not executable. A Word document is not executable, but often nowadays programs have some code so that you can program those documents, macros. My Microsoft Word has macros, you can write in what language, Visual Basic or something, such that the Word document, you can automate some tasks. So a macro virus infected those, was implemented in the macro language, infected the macros which was attached to files. What that meant, when you open up a Word document, if the macro code was executed, the virus is executed. And that was much easier, for a while at least, to spread because people learned not to trust exe files sent you an email someone sends you an exe file in an email, don't execute it. But if someone sends you a Word document in email, coming from your boss or your friend, maybe you'll open it. It's only a Word document, what can go wrong? What could go wrong is that it has a macro attached to it, which executes and therefore your computer gets infected. So macro viruses were a significant threat for some time. Now, therefore don't open Word documents in emails. And it's not just Word documents, it's other uh, files as well. Multipartite virus infects using a combination of those techniques. An example of a macro virus. You don't have this, but uh, because I'm just giving examples that just to illustrate some simple concepts. Uh, the Melissa, Melissa virus was one from many years ago, 1999 now. Okay, so this was a, a widespread virus in 1999, uh, and it was a macro virus. What happened was that someone created this virus, so they, they wrote some Visual Basic code. We'll see it in a moment. They wrote some code and they attached it to a Word document. And they posted a message, in this case on a news group, like on a forum. And when other people read that message and then opened up that Word file, the macro executed and the virus executed. And at that stage, it was common, or, or at least in some cases, that whenever Word opened the Word file, automatically it would execute the macro code, which it was a security problem. And that, since then, it's been disabled. So it don't uh, macro code is not executed. So it was originally spread, and then it uh, quickly spread to other computers because, in this case, it distributed itself by email. Okay, so to, it didn't necessarily, well, it copied itself to other Word documents, but also it created an email, automatically created an email from you who you've just been infected and sent to 50 of your friends, 50 of the people in your contact uh, book, including the attachment. And if some of those 50 people, just two of those 50 people were infected, then they send to 50 of their friends and then another four are infected and so on, it doesn't take long, maybe I've here, if, if you infect four new computers every hour, just four per hour, 
it, in one day, more than all of the people in the world are infected. Okay, so it doesn't long, take long to spread. That's the idea there. And this one spread quite quickly. And what it meant is that, the, especially companies, people in, in companies, it meant that uh, the, the virus had to be removed from all the systems and that took a lot of effort and effectively uh, cost a large amount of money for companies to remove the virus. The guy who created it spent two years in prison. So we will see the code, it's very simple, but just because we see it doesn't mean you should do something like that. It's just an example. I think I may have included the code at the back of your handouts. Did I? Sometimes I do. Yes, it's there on page 181. We will not look at everything. I don't fully understand Visual Basic, but we will see some of the key features in here and see how many lines of code is it. It's maybe what, one, one and a half pages of code. So this one and a half pages of Visual Basic code caused a billion dollars of, of damage. Um, well, it, it <laughs> Melissa, I don't know who Melissa was, maybe it was one of uh, the, the creator's friends. The idea, so this is attached to a Word document. So when you open up this Word document, this code gets executed. Some of the things that it does, uh, the first thing, so here's an if statement, this code here. This is checking, and Word had some security second settings such that if it was security setting was on, then Word would not execute the macros. So what this virus does is turns the security setting off so that next time this Word document is loaded, the virus is executed again. So this is just a check. If this setting is set, then try to set the security setting to be one. Okay, so if it was, uh, so that's what's happening here, trying to turn the security uh, of, of the macro code in Word off. Then what it does is that it tries to spread and it spreads in two ways. One way is attaching to other files on the system and the other is emailing itself to other people. And for email to work, the, a common email client and systems, especially in large organizations, is Microsoft Outlook. Microsoft Outlook is an email client and many large companies will use that. Uh, not the, the web-based system, but an actual program installed. And what it does is, if we look at these lines of code, it gets your address list from Microsoft Outlook. And for 50 of your, the people in your address book, so the first 50 people in your address book, so it grabs the address entries and it will stop after X is uh, 50. It creates an email. It sets the subject to this subject here. Important message from and it gets the username from the address book. So when you got it, it would say important message from Steve. And whenever you get an email saying important message from Steve, you of course open it. And if it's a Word document, you trust it. So it created that and it said as a body of the email, here is that document you asked for, don't show anyone else. So you get an email from someone you know saying here's the document, you think, oh, okay. Open up the Word document and then you're infected. And it sent that email. So that was one way, and that's how it spread uh, very fast to other systems. It also tried to attach itself to other Word documents. So the active document, the, the document that's currently open in Word, it attaches to its 
it that. That's in the, the next few lines of code. And to the normal template. You know Word, you use template files. A template file is read when you open a new document. So what it tried to do is attach to the template file. So whenever you open a new document in Word, that one would also be infected. And that's what the next few lines of code do. Attach to those other documents. I think it's just cleaning up here, closing the documents. And then at the end, this is what we sometimes call a logic bomb or a trigger. It's something that triggers under a certain event. If the day, if today's day is the same as to the minute right now, then print a message on the screen. Okay, so it didn't do anything, didn't do any damage or malicious, but it did uh, a harmless message to indicate you've been infected. So that was just a, uh, an example of what we call a logic bomb. It's triggered to execute when some logic conditions are met. And that was it. So it's 104 lines of code in this virus. Quite simple. Now it would not work because of some other security mechanism. So Word normally would not uh, automatically execute this. But in 1999, uh, around 2000, created a significant uh, damage. Of course, antivirus can try and detect viruses. So if you receive an email, your antivirus software may scan that email. If it finds a document that contains uh, virus code in there, then it can uh, uh, remove that. So a virus will therefore try to be programmed to conceal itself. So it's not detected by antivirus. And there are different concealment strategies. The virus may be encrypted. So if the virus code is encrypted, then all the antivirus software sees is random uh, strings, so it's difficult to detect. It's generally hard to do because the virus must uh, have a key to decrypt, so it's usually using some other malicious software to try and decrypt itself. A stealth virus will try to uh, hide itself from known antivirus detection me mechanisms, like the file size, like signatures, maybe um, try to overcome some of the antivirus software. And two ways that it can do, we'll talk about briefly a polymorphic and a metamorphic virus. A polymorphic virus changes itself. So what some antivirus software will do is that they know about viruses already, so if a virus has been found. So the antivirus software keeps a database. This malicious, malicious virus contains this code, and here's a hash of the malicious virus. So if you ever see a file with that same hash, then you've found the malicious virus. So the antivirus software would compare files with known viruses. So what a polymorphic virus tries to do is try to change. It tries to change every time it infects. It doesn't change how it works, but it changes its appearance. And the appearance may be it changes some code inside. So it still does the same thing. By changing, it means that now when the antivirus f software sees this file, it doesn't match the known virus because the code has changed. So that's a way that it tries to hide itself. A metamorphic virus also tries to change by changing the code, but it not only changes how it appears, but it also changes what it does. And this makes it even harder for virus to de detection software to work because it, there's significant changes in how it behaves and virus detection software 
sometimes even looks at what the code does to determine if it's a virus or not. And if it's changing its behavior all the time, it's very hard for the virus detection software to know what to look for. So a metamorphic virus is harder to detect, but generally harder to create. Give me, how, give me some guide of how to write code that will be different in two versions of the virus, but do the same thing. How can you change some code such that the functionality is the same, but the code looks different? You, the virus needs to change itself. Not you, the programmer. The virus needs to be programmed so that when it copies to another application, the code changes. The virus still needs to execute, but the code needs to be different. Right? So the assembly code or the machine instructions need to be different. Every time you copy to the other executable, it looks different each time. Well, the there are some basic ways. The, the concept is... That is, you have the virus, which is the original virus may be version 1, virus 1, and it has some code in it. And maybe the code, and this is not realistic, but maybe the code sets some variables in its assembly instructions, not in uh, this language, but sets some variables in the code and then does something with those variables then when that virus copies itself and creates a new version, virus version 2, all the other lines of code are the same, we could swap these two. So that's what we mean by changing the code, but it still does exactly the same thing, because it doesn't matter what order we set those variables, it will still use them, they'll have the same value. So that's one simple example of what the virus does. It's programmed such that when it copies itself, it changes specific lines of code. It will still work, but it will not be exactly the same as the previous version. The other way would be when it copies itself again from version 2 to version 3, same lines, introduce an operation that does nothing. And assembly or machine instructions, there are instructions that do nothing, a no-op. I'm sure all you're good at assembly or uh, hardware programming, but there are no-op operations which do nothing. All right, so now the code is different, but the functionality is the same. So we've inserted when the code copies itself, it inserts some no-ops such that everything still works, but the virus detection software recognizes, ah, this V3 is not the same as V2, so it's harder to detect. That's the idea of polymorphic viruses. Metamorphic viruses, we'll not show an example, is they'll change, but they'll do different things. And that's much harder to program. Write software such that when it runs, it changes itself. The software changes itself. It becomes a new type of virus, right. It may do different things. So much harder to detect, but much harder to create as well. Well, example viruses, we saw the Melissa virus as an example. Another one, uh, the crypto locker. Oh, we mentioned the equation group. Crypto locker is uh, called ransomware, which is once it infected a computer, we said it, the damage it does is encrypts the files. So that's a special case called ransomware. It, encrypts your files and then pops up a message saying your files have been encrypted. 
if you want to decrypt them, within two days you must send $300 to this account using Bitcoin, which is considered anonymous payment, such that once you pay, you'll, you'll get the key to decrypt and get all your files back. So that was an example of uh, the damage that a virus could do. What about worms? A worm, there's similarities between a worm and a virus. Sometimes we, we mix them up. But a worm is usually a standalone program. It doesn't attach to another one to execute. It's a standalone program. And it would normally seek out other computers to infect. So copy itself as a program. And because it was a standalone program and, and, and to copy itself to other computers, it usually uses some network software to do that and often had to take advantage of bugs in other network software like web servers, like uh, uh, client applications. may also be spread via media. So again, you pick up the USB drive, install it, and there's a file on there which is the worm which executes. So it can do the same as a virus. But the distinguishing thing is that a virus attaches itself to other files, programs to execute. A worm is a standalone program that it executes. There's not much more to say about worms, I think. Uh, how does it spread? How does a program get to other computers? How does it replicate different network software? File sharing software, you install some file sharing software and it copies itself to others, other computers. Um, email or instant messaging, so there's an attachment. So the program is an attachment to an, a message which is then executed. Often problems or bugs in software that allows you to remotely log in to computers or remotely connect to computers. So usually required network software to, to distribute itself. So an example. Just one example of a worm. This was in 2001. It was called the Code Red Worm. There's no need to copy this down. It's just one example. The idea was that the worm infected web servers. Right, so web server specifically, there was a, a web server from Microsoft called IIS, Internet Information Server. So the web servers are running this software. What a web server normally does, a web browser sends a HTTP GET request to the server. The server finds a file and sends back a response. So that's HTTP to communicate from browser to server. So the server just receives requests, gets the file, sends it back. There are some other things you can do with a server. You can send information to the server and the server may uh, trigger some operations like update a database. There was a bug in the web server such that you could send a very special encoded request from a browser, a special HTTP GET request such that when the web server received that, it stored some, some part of that message in, in memory, in RAM. So the web server received this very strange request. There was a bug in the server such that what was inside the request was stored in memory. And in a location such that it was executed. So it was essentially executed by the web server. So that infected the computer running the web server. The worm was stored in RAM. Of course, if you shut down that computer, the, the RAM is cleared and the worm is deleted. But most web servers stay running 24-7, so they're not shut down. So the worm was left there running. And what the worm do did once it infected that computer is it tried to infect other computers. So the web server's infected. Now the worm would send requests to random other computers, other web servers, trying to infect them. And it did that for 19 days. This was the design to spread to other computers. 
Then it tried to do a denial of service attack. And our next topic is on denial of service attacks, but you know, I think you know the idea is to overload some service. Here it was overload to the White House website. So it just sent many requests to a particular website with the idea that not just this one, but all the other infected web servers are also sending requests to that one, one website to overload it. It didn't last that long. It infected about 200,000 web servers in about five hours. And that caused a lot of the network resources due to the denial of service attack to, to be consumed. So a lot of the messages being sent meant the network was very slow. There was some modified versions that took advantage of, of uh, even though the holes in the web server were fixed, they tried to take advantage of other bugs. So a key point here is that often worms will take advantage of bugs in software. So when you're going out with your job and you're working in IT security, what do you do to overcome this? What's a simple thing you can do to overcome such a worm? Well, you can't, you can't necessarily fix all the bugs in the software, okay? but a simple thing is make sure that your software is up to date. Because commonly what happens is that the software, servers especially, uh, bugs are found and they're fixed and updates are issued. So if you update or keep your software up to date or at least keep track of the bugs which are found, then it's less likely that someone can take advantage of bugs in your software that's running. So keeping software up to date and keeping track of bugs in software is a key security mechanism. Because many attacks take advantage of bugs. In the same way that you keep your operating system up to date. Okay. So that was an example of a worm. What have we got? Well, social engineering. So worms and viruses are spreading of malicious software via, usually via uh, network means. Social engineering is tricking users into compromising their own system. And you've probably received the email saying, uh, your email account has reached its limit please send your username and password back to this and we'll, we'll increase the, the limit or the quota on your email account. Or please uh, follow the instructions in this link so that we can give you something extra. So these are uh, spam email coming from people with the intention that you will think it's a real email from someone that you should follow the instructions. You follow the instructions and that leads to installation of malicious software on your computer. And so it's usually done by attachments or maybe even nowadays links in those emails. So you see a link, you click on the link, it takes you to what you thought was your bank website but it's actually a fake website that then gathers information. And that's commonly used in what's called phishing attacks. What's a phishing attack? Anyone know? Um, <laughs> um, you use a lure. Use a lure, right. Uh, when they take the bed, help, you, uh, you pull them in. You use a lure, when they take the bait, you pull them in. Right, well, but with respect to tricking them to doing something. So you lure them in to do uh, by offering something offering something free, offering something of use to them, the, the, other, the users, and when they uh, follow a link, or open an attachment, then that leads them to execute the malicious software. We'll see some uh, further examples in the later slides. And another aspect of social engineering is called a Trojan horse. And this is software that we think is useful and is useful, right? It does something that we want, 
but it also does some harmful things. So I need some software to uh, unzip my files. All right? So I go download a free zip utility. It's very useful for me. It unzips all my files. But included in that software is all some hidden malicious actions. So now when I download that software and use it, it also does some malicious things on my computer. So that's called a Trojan horse. So the harmful functions are hidden inside something that's quite useful. So another way that malicious software can propagate. What have we got left? Let's just see. Right, let's just go through these four slides, I think, briefly. No, we'll go through them next week. Let's give one last example. These examples, uh, no need to remember. A couple of them that I think are links from the website. And this one is an interesting one because it was quite a complex example. It's, I don't expect you to read it, but there is a, it's a 60 or 70 page PDF from a security company explaining a particular security attack, malicious software. And this malicious stof software was called Stuxnet. Okay, everyone's heard of Stuxnet? Maybe when it was released you may have heard it in the news. So this was in 2011. And this is a nice document because it explains how it works. And what Stuxnet was, was some malicious software. It actually took advantage of multiple bugs at the time. And what people think it did was to shut down or, or to compromise the nuclear reactors or the nuclear research facilities in Iran. So they think it was done from a, a government agency tried to stop the Iran from developing nuclear materials. By, and the way they did that was to get the equipment that helps in the development of nuclear materials to f malfunction. Centrifuges, things that spin, get them to operate outside of their normal conditions so that they fail. And that was done with malicious software. So we'll just highlight some of the things in here and we'll, some will recognise, some we'll uh, see in the next few slides. No need for you to read, I'll just mention some of the things, it's very hard to see, but uh, it, this malicious software took advantage of several bugs in Microsoft files, like uh, you can have link files, LNK files on a disk which will automatically uh, there was a bug that it will automatically be executed when you open a disk with that file. It spread through LANs using print, some bugs in printers or print software and through some other network software, Samba or SMB. Uh, what did it do? Let's see. What it did was tried to compromise industrial control systems. So in factories, in this case in nuclear power, or not nuclear research centres where they're trying to develop materials, there's certain equipment that, uh, and which are controlled by computers. Okay, so say a centrifuge that spins and to create materials and it's controlled by a computer. And those computers that control the hardware, the equipment, are usually not on a network or not on the internet. They don't have internet access. They may be on a LAN inside the, the, the building, but they don't have external internet access. So how can we infect a computer from the other side of the world which we don't, that doesn't have internet access? How do they get started? We've got a computer that operates a machine. We want to make that machine fail. So we're going to try and infect that machine with malicious software. How can we infect that machine if it has no internet access. How do we infect something that we can't connect to via the internet? We need some physical means, maybe some USB drive. So the first portion of the attack was to get someone from outside to inside the LAN. There's no external internet access, but there is a local area network to get someone with a USB or some other disk drive to plug it into a computer. Whether it was deliberately 
or whether it was uh, accidentally, that is someone had, had their infected USB drive, they plugged it into a computer. That computer doesn't have internet access, but it does have access to a LAN. And that computer was then infected, and then that spread and tried to find computers inside the LAN. And the way that it spread inside the LAN, using some of these different techniques of the errors in the print software in Windows, uh, the, the file sharing software in Windows. And then what it did, and it describes the scenario here, uh, it's worth reading just the first two or three pages. It eventually found the computer that controls the machinery in the factory or in the, the, the building. And essentially what it did is then it had another piece of malicious software that made it operate outside of its normal conditions. Maybe make it spin too fast, for example. Spin so fast that it would break down. And that was the end result, that the machines would break down with the aim of stopping them from developing nuclear material. We will see in some of the later topics that for this to work, for Windows to run software, nowadays Windows checks the drivers and checks whether they are signed. So the Windows won't run any or allow you to install any drivers for hardware. It must be signed by a trusted organization. So another form of this attack was to compromise the organizations that sign the drivers and to get a signed driver on this uh, malicious software to make sure that the hardware or the Windows would accept the software. So we'll see this, the role of digital certificates in a later topic as well. So what I suggest for homework before next week, and I think there's a link on the website, if not, you'll find it, there's read at least the first, so this is just page three, read the attack scenario here, the first three pages of this document, just one page of the attack scenario, the executive sum summary, and you'll see some of the malicious software that we've talked about, and you'll see in a real attack, and the complexities involved. What we'll do next week is quickly go through malicious software by payloads, and then some of the countermeasures that antivirus uses.